So, hello everyone, thank you for uh, coming. So today we'll have a lecture from uh, Misha, who is a fellow here. Uh, so it's the first uh, uh, part because it will be uh, two lectures on uh, small bodies in the solar system. So this is the first one on meteorite. And the second one will happen in uh, August or yeah, August. further <laughs> in time on uh, asteroids. So thank you, Misha, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, so indeed, I wanted to give you uh, an in introductory talk about uh, small bodies in our solar system that would include both both the uh, laboratory perspective of st studying meteorites and the astrophysical uh, perspective of studying asteroids and comets uh, using uh, big telescopes like ESOs. Uh, but yeah, as I gathered the material together, I, I, I realized I had too much uh, for a single lecture. So today uh, it will be about the, the about meteorites. Okay, so uh, for people in this room who study like big objects, stars, galaxies, or even the universe as a whole, uh, meteorites and small bodies might seem may maybe a little bit insignificant, but I hope I will convince you in this talk that they are scientifically extremely important for anyone who uh, wants to understand planetary formation and uh, studying protoplanetary disks. Um, so one of the reasons why we, we care about small bodies in our solar system is because they are tracers of the chemical and thermal condition that prevailed in the uh, protoplanetary disk 4.5 billion years ago. So, you know, on Earth, all the rocks were processed geologically. At some point, the, the Earth was a giant, giant magma. So we lost this information about uh, the, the early solar system in Earth's rocks. But this is not the case, at least for some um, some uh, categories of, uh, of meteorites that have retained this information about our protoplanetary disk. The second reason is uh, that um, small bodies in our solar system are exquisite tracers of planetary migration that happened during the first million to 100 million years of uh, solar system evolution. So where we find small bodies today in our solar system and where we don't find them, allows to put very important constraints on uh, dynamical models that try to reproduce the uh, current architecture of, uh, of our solar system and uh, what type of migration happened uh, to, in order to explain this uh, architecture. Um, small bodies, they also source of uh, earth water and organic matter amino acids which are the building blocks for proteins which are the building blocks for every living things on earth uh, have been found at the surface of these objects so prebiotic uh, chemistry is happening in space on these objects and it's possible that uh, the uh, complex organic molecule that led to the emergence of life on earth they were brought uh, by uh, by these objects uh, of course, studying our solar system is co closely related to the study of uh, debris disks and protoplanetary disks ar around other stars. So from this uh, astronomical observation of uh, disks around other stars, we can get the pop population scale uh, information. Uh, when we study our solar system, we just study one system, but we can study it in very uh, fine details to the micrometer scale uh, inside meteorites, right? And uh, finally, we all know what happened to the dinosaurs in the past. They didn't have a, a space program. Uh, so, you know, we don't want the same thing happening to us. So understanding small bodies in our solar system is quite important for um, to mitigate the threat that uh, they represent for civilization and uh, life on our planet. And of course, we all have in mind the, the DART mission that happened last year, which was uh, pretty amazing. The first planetary defense mission uh, that tested um, a kinetic impactor on a small asteroid to to see if we we could uh, change its orbit just in case someday if we find one of these objects going direction of the Earth we will be prepared. Uh, so before going further, I'd like to classify uh, clarify sorry a few definitions about small bodies. Uh, that's for detail. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what's the difference between a comet, an asteroid, a meteoroid, a meteor, and a meteorite? Uh, so, comet is a chunk of ice and, and rock that originated from the outer solar system. There are two main reservoirs, the, the uh, Kuiper belt located beyond the orbit of Neptune, and there's the Oort cloud that extends even further away. 
Uh, so the hour cloud is the source of long period comets, so objects that have an orbital period of more than 200 years. I think that's the limit. And so as comets come close to the sun, they uh, start to sublimate their volatile species and they develop these beautiful tails, and that's usually how we uh, detect them and study them. Uh, asteroids are rocks that uh, are usually between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter, but uh, this is very simplified definition because now we find a lot of evidence for water ice in the asteroid belt. So from a physical uh, point of view, but also from even from an orbital point of view, the, the, the difference between comets and asteroids is not as clear as uh, it used to be. But let's say, okay, asteroids are rocky objects, maybe a little bit icy that are between Mars and Jupiter. And sometimes they get a little bit too excited by Jupiter and their uh, orbital eccentricity get pumped up and they end up on very uh, elliptical orbit that may uh, cross the orbit of the Earth. And when that happens, we call them NEOs, nearest objects. Uh, a meteoroid is basically a small NEO, or it could be also a small uh, piece of, uh, of comet. So it's a space rock that's bigger than a dust grain, but smaller than an asteroid. And if it's unlucky enough to uh, cross the Earth on its path, uh, it will burn up it in its atmosphere and become a meteor. So a meteor is also what we call a falling star, and there are the streak of light that we see when the object enters the Earth's atmosphere and start, uh, starts uh, burning up. And if uh, the meteor is big enough so that it doesn't entirely consume itself in the Earth's atmosphere, then it will eventually reach the ground, and then, and then we call it a meteorite. So a meteorite is a space rock that we found at the surface of the Earth. And meteorites are uh, scientifically <clears throat> extremely valuable for the reason I, I told you before. And that's why we have people, uh, scientists, uh, coming to different places around the world to look for them. And one of these places is uh, actually the Atacama Desert. Uh, so that's actually close to uh, Paranal or uh, maybe I'm, I'm not sure. But um, so this uh, photo was sent by a friend of mine uh, who came last year to look for meteorites in the Atacama Desert. And the reason why they come to the Atacama Desert is because it's a very dry place. So uh, the meteorites are very well preserved over time. They are not weathered. They, are not, they don't get rust, uh, rusty too, too quickly. And the other reason is because the soil is so, so bright. Uh, and so they are, uh, fresh meteorites are very easy to spot. And um, I think you can find it here on this, uh, on this image. That's the meteorite. Um, it's not like this everywhere in the, uh, in, in the desert. Unfortunately, I've been looking for meteorites around Paranal, and there's a lot of dark rocks <laughs> that, that, that are terrestrial rocks. Um, so when, when, when these people, they come to, to Chile to look for meteorites first, what, what they check are the satellite images of the desert, and they, they choose the, the places where the, the soil is uh, the lighter, light colored. So it's easier to spot the meteorite, okay? Uh, meteorite, when you find them, they, uh, they more or less look all the same um, because again, uh, as they were a meteor in the atmosphere and burning up, they, dev they develop this fusion crust at the surface, which is, uh, which is very, very dark, um, for, at least for fresh objects. Then they, they look more and more uh, like uh, Earth rocks. But, uh, so every meteorite, they look a bit the same, but if you crack them open and you polish them and you uh, look inside, uh, they show this amazing diversity of uh, composition and texture, and they're absolutely beautiful and scientifically uh, extremely, extremely important. So now I'd like to walk you through the different types of meteorites that we found on Earth and what, we, what our compositional interpretation and original, origin interpretation for, this, uh, for these objects. And uh, so I'll start with the most common type of meteorites that we found. They are called undifferentiated chondrites. They represent about 86% of finds uh, on Earth. And scientifically, for someone who cares about uh, studying the protoplanetary disk of our solar system, they are probably the most interesting objects. And that's because they are very, very primitive compositionally, and they weren't subject to um, a lot of uh, alteration metamorphic alteration of or uh, water water alteration. So here on the left, you have an example of undifferentiated, undifferentiated chondrite. It's meteorite Allende, like the former uh, Chilean president, but um, the name comes from a, a village in Mexico where it, where it was found. <clears throat> uh, 
And if you look inside the meteorite, you see uh, this is what it, it looks like. So you, you find three main components inside these undifferentiated chondrites. The first one are chondrules. That's where the name chondrites come from. Chondrules are these little spherical uh, balls of silicates that you can also see here at the, the top left. And they are basically uh, solidified droplets of silicate that were melted at some point in the protoplanetary disk. They were melted uh, at very high temperature and then they cool down very quickly. We don't know what the mechanism was. There's, there's a lot of papers being published on a possible mechanism. Could be a formation in bow shocks in the solar nebula. It could be energetic impacts between planetesimal. It could be uh, that they form it in X-wing uh, during the T-Tauri phase uh, of the sun. It's, it, it's not really clear. We, we just know that these tiny balls of silicate uh, were melted, solidified, and then they accreted into uh, the, the, the chondrites. And <clears throat> around these chondrules, you find these, uh, what we call the matrix. The matrix, you can see it as a space concrete. It's a consolidate, uh, consolidated um, interplanetary particles that are uh, packed and they're very, they are very fine grained, so it's a sub micrometer to micrometer uh, size grains. Uh, so they are mostly made of silicates, oxides, and uh, other other things, and they 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 hold the chondrules together. Uh, and the third component are these uh, very light patches that you see on the image, uh, which are the called CAIs, and CAIs means calcium aluminium rich inclusions, and those are the oldest solids that solidified in the protoplanetary disk. They are the, the most refractory element that we find in the protoplanetary, in the solar system, and they are the first solids that formed 4.5 billion years ago, okay? So for cosmochemists who study our solar system, that's when the, the clock starts ticking. That's the T0 for our solar system. The, the formation time of calcium aluminum rich inclusion and everything else is uh, dated with respect to calcium aluminum rich inclusion. And in this presentation, I will explain how we know uh, these ages. As I say, these meteorites are very uh, primitive. Uh, on the right plot, you see the uh, elemental abundance of the solar photosphere as y-axis, as function of uh, elemental abundances uh, inside um, uh, undifferentiated chondrites. And you can see that except for the most volatile elements like hydrogen and helium, but also oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and the noble gas like neon and argon, there's a, there's a very good match between the, the solar photosphere and chondrites. Lithium is a bit off the curve, um, the one-to-one -one curve, because it's, uh, I think it's preferentially destroying the convection zone of the sun, but otherwise the elemental abundances, they, they agree within a factor two or something like this. If you heat up, uh, if you take a, a chondrite and you put it in an oven and you heat it up, you will see some textural changes. So here you can see the chondrules. This is a very primitive chondrite. You see the chondrules and the matrix. Uh, as you increase the temperature, you will allow chemical exchanges to happen between uh, the chondrules and the matrix even, uh, until they eventually reach chemical equilibrium. If you heat them up at uh, very high temperature, they will eventually melt and uh, recrystallize. And then you get uh, something that looks like uh, not a chondrite. <laughs> you, you get something that looks like an achondrite. So an achondrite is... Um, is a meteorite, a type of meteorite that uh, represents about nine percent of, of the finds, and we don't see we we don't see the controls. We see large crystals, which uh, are due to the fact that these objects come from dif differentiated planetesimal, so planetesimal that heated and then differentiated into a core, a mantle, and a crust, a little bit like uh, the Earth, and so the the achondrites will be fragments of the crust of these differentiated uh, planetesimals. And uh, interestingly, we have a tiny fraction of achondrite that come from the moon and other that come from Mars. We have meteorites from the moon and Mars in our collections. And they're also achondrites. Another type of meteorite that come from differentiated body are the iron meteorites. 
very famous, um, which uh, come from the core of uh, differentiated objects. Uh, so think about it, next time you have one in your hand, you're basically holding a planetary core, which is pretty cool. And uh, they represent about 4% of the fines. And what's interesting about the, them, uh, one thing that is very interesting about them are these uh, diagonal uh, mineralogical structures that we find that we call, uh, I don't know if there's any German in the room, I'm sorry for, <laughs> they are called the uh, Wienmannstaden pa patterns. And the Wienmannstaden patterns, they have different thickness from meteorite from meteorite. And this thickness is related to the cooling rate of the parent body of the meteorite. So by studying this, uh, these patterns, uh, we can tell, uh, we can infer the cooling rates of the parent body of these meteorites. And we can tell that from this cooling rate, these objects must have been uh, quite small, a few hundred kilometers in size. So, you know, that's the first constraint on the, the initial size of uh, planetesimals in our solar system. Uh, yeah, so we know basically that planets small formed uh, as bodies of a few hundred kilometers in size. And the last uh, type of meteorites that we find are stony iron meteorites. They are absolutely beautiful. They are quite rare. This on the left is a palatite. If one day you find one, you're very lucky. They are very valuable scientifically, but also uh, money-wise. <laughs> this one costs uh, probably a few a few thousand dollars or a few tens of thousand dollars, I don't know. But if I were you, I would keep it if I found one because they are absolutely beautiful. And on the right is a mesosiderite, okay? So we, <clears throat> yeah, sorry, I, I should I should say, uh, so those are uh, uh, silicate, cre large silicate crystals, uh, probably olivine, and it's embedded it's in this alloy of uh, iron and nickel uh, uh, minerals. Uh, so we find we have all this amazing diversity of uh, compositions and textures. Um, and uh, but what, what does it mean in terms of origin? So I've already uh, said it, but basically uh, just to repeat, to make sure we're on the same page. So chondritic stony meteorite, they come from uh, undifferentiated planetesimals. Uh, and then achondrite stony iron and iron meteorites, they come from different compositional layers of a differentiated uh, planetesimal. In the case of stony iron meteorites like palisite, uh, for, for some time people say uh, they probably originated some, somewhere at the interface between the core and the mantle of these differentiated planetesimals, but uh, it's, not, um, it, it's not really clear. They could come from uh, energetic collisions as well. Uh, what was puzzling about the size of the planet small that was inferred from these Wienmannstaden patterns inside the iron meteorites is that they form, we, we know that parent body of meteorites form small. And so actually, if you do the math, converting the gravitational binding energy of a collapsing cloud of dust, and you convert that into thermal energy, you don't have enough temperature to melt the interior of planetesimals. So at the beginning, people thought uh, meteorite, they sample very few numbers of uh, large uh, planetesimals. Um, now we know it's not the case. And it was uh, after some time that people understood that actually the main heat source in the interior of planetesimal was uh, radioactivity. And in particular, the radioactive decay of uh, short-lived isotopes like uh, iron-60 or aluminum-26. Aluminum-26 is the main heat source. Uh, so aluminum-26 uh, has a short half-life time of about uh, 1 million years. Yes? Oh, so you need something, uh, uh, 2,000, 3,000 kilometer in diameter. Yeah. So for people online who didn't hear the question, uh, that's the size that, that is needed for, to melt an asteroid from the gravitational binding energy. Yeah. So aluminum-26 is, um, is unstable over a million year timescales, and it, it decays into a uh, excited magnesium-26 by uh, converting a proton into a neutron by emitting a neutrino and a positron. Then you get an excited magnesium that releases a photon and you get a quotient uh, magnesium. And that's the, the main heat, heat source of uh, planetesimal. 
So now I'd like to talk uh, about the isotopes, uh, what, we, what we learned from the study of isotopes inside meteorites, because uh, they, these isotopes are our main uh, source of information about where and when uh, uh, meteorites and therefore planets more formed in our solar system. I'd like to start with where, I'll, I, I'd like to explain how isotope can help us understanding where uh, planetary formation took place. And to do that, uh, I'm going to talk about oxygen. So oxygen is a very important species in the pr uh, protoplanetary disk. It combines into carbon and hydrogen to form gases like CO, H2O. It forms with solids to form oxides, um, silicates. And uh, there are different flavors of oxygen in nature. Uh, oxygen 16, which is by far the, the most abundant, about 99.8% of uh, oxygen in is oxygen 16, and then you have oxygen 17 and 18, which are much more rare. And this means that uh, in the protoplanetary disk where uh, oxygen was mostly in the CO form, you will have different uh, column densities for the, for, the photo, for the light that can photo dissociate uh, these species. Okay? So, What's happening in the case of uh, CO16, which was uh, very abundant? So in that case, you have a disk that is optically thick, such that you will have what we call CO self-shielding happening. So basically, the UV light coming from the, the young sun and the surrounding, uh, surrounding stars in the stellar nursery, they will not be able to penetrate deep inside the disk because the CO at the, uh, at the edge of the disk will shield CO in the mean plane, okay? But in the case of a much more uh, rare version of oxygen, like oxygen 17 and 18, the disk was optically thin, and then the radiation can go deeper, and then you will uh, photodissociate uh, carbon and oxygen even in, the, even in the mean plane of the disk, okay? And then, so you release some oxygen that can combine with hydrogen to form water molecules, and what hydrodynamical simulation show is that this water molecule can migrate inward uh, through, sorry, through uh, turbulent forces, and they eventually react with silicates. So we have CO with oxygen 16 that stays in the CO form in the mean plane. You have CO 17 and 18 in H2O molecules that migrate inward. So you end up with a disk that is enriched in uh, heavy oxygen towards the inner edge of the disk, uh, whereas the outer edge of the disk will be uh, lighter in uh, light, uh, sorry, lighter in terms of uh, isotopic composition of oxygen. And so from the isotopic abundances that we measure in meteorites and planets, we can tell which objects shared common origins and which one form a different location. Okay, so that's for the for the where how isotope can uh, help us constraining where the, all these objects form. And, and now I'll, uh, I'll talk about the when. So the when is we have to turn to uh, radioactive species. So I already talked about aluminium-26. Remember, our main source of energy in planetesimals. Well, aluminium-26 is also super useful to uh, date the ages of, uh, of, of, of rocks, of uh, meteorites. Uh, but yeah, it's not the only one. So here is a sketch that um, illustrates our current understanding of planet formation from micrometer-sized dust to uh, planet-sized objects. So you start from the condensation of dust in the protoplanetary disk from, from the gas, so you form some micrometer to micrometer-sized uh, dust. Then they, uh, these dust will um, agglomerate into centimeters centimeter size uh, uh, agg um, agglomerates. And uh, rapidly you go from centimeter size to uh, hundred of, well, kilometer or hundred of kilometer size planetesimals. Uh, we think the, like the, the, the current um, uh, mechanism to do that is uh, like rapid pebble accretion in uh, streaming instabilities in the disk. So you rapidly grow from a centimeter size objects to kilometer size objects or larger. And then you will have uh, planetesimal growing through a collision into planetary embryos 
and uh, so things like the, the size of Mars and the planetary embryos at some point they will um, form uh, planet sized objects through chaotic, uh, chaotic growth so very big collision between uh, Mars sized objects. And so meteorites from their uh, isotopic record and in particular the isotopic record of um, radioactive species they can help us constrain when each of these uh, steps happen in the protoplanetary disk. So when these objects are created, they are created with some radioactive elements. One of them was uranium-235. Uranium-235 likes to decay into lead-207. So uranium-235 is the parent species. Lead-207 is the uh, daughter species. And so the number of uh, lead 207 that we, that we measure today in meteorites is what existed originally when the object accreted, plus the number of uh, uranium atom that decayed into lead 207, okay? And so from <clears throat> the number of atoms that decayed is related to uh, the decay constant of the species, which in the case of uranium 235 is about a billion year, 700 million years. And uh, delta T, which is the formation time of the rock, okay? And that's what we are interested in. We want to know uh, when these rocks um, uh, formed. Not working. This is stuck. I mean, it's moving on my computer, but uh, not on the screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the same equation as before. Um, but as you as you keep, may see in this equation, we have a problem because so we want to know the age of the rock. But how do you know the original uh, number of uh, daughter species that you have in your rock when, when it forms? So you have one equation and two, two unknown. So we have to use a trick, which consists in, is it stuck again? Okay, uh, so you, yeah, so you, we need to use a trick uh, which, which is dividing each term of, in this equation by um, an abundance of a stable version of the daughter species, okay? So remember the, the um, lead 207 is the daughter species of uh, uranium-235 and lead 204 is a constant, okay? So if you if you measure uh, all these um, uh, abundances at t equal now today inside your uh, inside your rock, and uh, you plot this uh, you plot the isotopic abundances in that case lead 207 over lead 204 as a function of the elemental abundances in your rock, then everything will uh, fall on a on an horizontal line, right? Because they all are created at the same time, so they all have the same isotope ratio, but by definition, they are different minerals, so they have different elemental abundances, okay? But what's happening, uh, what will happen over time is that uh, you will have uranium-235 decaying such that the uh, lead to, the, the ratio of lead-207 over lead-204 will increase with time, and it will increase proportionally to the number of uranium-235 that uh, decayed, and therefore proportionally to the age of uh, of uh, of the rock. So after some time, this is what you will measure, and uh, um, the so this is what we call an isochron, and the slope of the isochron gives you the age of the rock, and the intersect of the isochron will the y-axis on this graph will give you the original ratio of lead 207 over lead 204. Okay, so that's the principle how we we date. Uh, uh, Meteorites, but also rock uh, terrestrial rocks. So 
So, suck again. Okay. So what, what, did, what did we learn from this measurement? So let's go back to undifferentiated chondrites. You remember that they are made of uh, three different components, the chondral, the matrix, and the calcium aluminum rich inclusions. So in the case of calcium aluminum rich inclusion, these will, uh, were dated thanks to the uranium lead uh, isochrome diagrams back to 4.57 billion years old, okay? This is true both for pristine uh, CAIs and CAIs of centimeter size, so centimeter, centimeter size agglomerates that were melted, thermally melted, and uh, reaccreted, and uh, recrystallized, sorry. So we, we find the same ages within error bars on the measurement, and this uh, tells us that the, we went from um, micrometer size grains to uh, centimeter size aggregates in less than 50,000 years. And that's, uh, that upper limit comes from the precision that we can from the radiometric dating, okay? Then the chondrules were dated from contemporarily to uh, CAIs, up to 4 million years after CAIs. And all, all these elements were accreted together in the same bodies that again are a few hundred kilometers in size. And so we know that we went from so, uh, micrometer size dust and centimeter size aggregate to um, planetesimal uh, size objects, a few hundred kilometers in size, in less than four million years. Okay? So let's go back to, the, to this sketch. From the radiometric measurement of calcium aluminium rich inclusion, we know that condensation started about 4.57 billion years ago. Then we have the growth to centimeter size objects in less than 50,000 years. Then we have formation of uh, planetesimal and even planetary embryos in uh, less than four, four million years. And uh, from uh, measurement in planetary mantles and from uh, lunar rocks, we know that uh, accretion to planet size objects took another few tens of million years. The moon forming, uh, the moon forming event, which uh, is one of the last big step of uh, accretion for our planet, was dated somewhere between 30 and 150 million years old. It's quite uncertain in the literature. There's a big fight about these numbers. And uh, actually I have a project with Aries to try to get an ind independent measurement on that. We'll see if it works. Um, and so, uh, let, what, Let's compare that to the astrophysics per perspective of studying young stellar objects. And this slide is mostly for people who study uh, pl protoplanetary disks, maybe people from ALMA. Uh, so we usually talk about uh, young um, stellar objects in terms of class zero, class one, class two, and class uh, three phases uh, following the collapse of the parent uh, molecular and uh, uh, cloud. And the, the difference between these uh, different cl classes is the, the amount of um, black body radiation that you can measure from the dust in the system with respect to what you measure uh, from, uh, from the stars. That's very simplified, but as, uh, as the, the uh, plant is more formed and uh, the dust gets cleared, uh, you, you get more and more uh, radiation from, uh, from the star and less and less from the, from, from the surrounding dust, okay? So um, it's been argued that the first condensates uh, CAIs formed somewhere between the class one and class two. So that's the formation of calcium aluminum rich inclusions. And the reason is because we found beryllium 10 uh, isotopes in the meteorites that are supposed to have formed during the titori phase uh, of the sun. Uh, I've talked to ALMA people yesterday and they strongly disagree. <laughs> They, 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 they think the uh, condensation starts in the class zero phase and then uh, the formation of uh, planets, uh, at least the, the giant Jupiter should take very short time, like less than a million years. So I don't know. There seem to be some inconsistencies between the meteorite record and the observation of protoplanetary disks, which is uh, quite interesting in some way. 
And then we had the formation of the controls between zero and three uh, million years, or four million years after the calcium and aluminium rich inclusion. So that would be between class, class two and uh, class three. And the melting of planetesimal, which, uh, which would have happened contemporarily between one and five million years after the formation of calcium and aluminium rich inclusion. Okay, that's all for isotopes. I'd like to talk about uh, a different field of research about meteorites, which I think it's uh, uh, very interesting, which is called paleomagnetism. It sounds like a very a bit weird <laughs> as a word, but it's quite, actually paleo just means old and magnetic means magnetic. So it's the study of ancient magnetic field that was recorded in, uh, in meteorites, okay? And uh, this field of research can uh, address very important question about the uh, evolution of uh, our protoplanetary disk, and in particular, the timing of the dissipation of uh, the, the protoplanetary disk in our solar system. So there is very good evidence that some meteorites were magnetized during the, the in the protoplanetary disk due to the motion of charged particles in the disk that uh, sustained a large-scale dynamo, okay? So in meteorites, you find uh, ferromagnetic minerals, and if you remember your physics uh, classes, ferromagnetic minerals, when they are heated above a certain temperature threshold, which we call the Curie point, uh, the spin of the unpaired uh, electron inside the minerals will uh, align their magnetic moment with the ambient uh, magnetic field, okay? And this, uh, this alignment of uh, the, the spins of the electron can be uh, retained after uh, the temperature cools down be below the Curie point. So what, what is recorded in the meteorite is what happened when the temperature cools down below the, the Curie point, okay? And this remnant magnetization that we find inside uh, rocks, meteorites, uh, is something that can be measured in laboratory. And it's, uh, it's uh, linked to the ambient field, so in that case, the paleomagnetic field, through a constant, which is the remnant susceptibility, which is a property of the material uh, itself, okay? So again, we have one equation to unknown. So what we have to do is, in laboratory, demagnetize the sample. Once you've done your measurement, you have to demagnetize your sample, and then you remagnetize it progressively with a known electromagnetic field in your laboratory, and you measure the uh, induced magnetic moment in your rock, okay? And then, so you, you can uh, combine the two equations and solve for the paleomagnetic uh, field. Uh, it's a destructive measurement, unfortunately. And uh, for, for, for astronomers, we're not used to that, right? If you, if you observe a star, you don't, you don't destroy it. Uh, worst case scenario, if you screw up your observations, you, you, you have to write another proposal and come back next year and, and repeat your observations. But for, the, for, for these people, you know, if they screw up, uh, the, the information is gone. Um, and uh, yeah, in theory, the, the, the principle seems simple, but the, the uh, measurements are actually uh, very, uh, very challenging. And one of the reasons why they are so challenging is because uh, we don't, uh, at the beginning, we don't really know the origin of the magnetization, right? So I say it may come from the, the protoplanetary disk, but if, if you're studying a rock that was formed on a differentiated planetesimal that uh, formed the core and mantle and the crust, and you have a liquid magma in, inside it, and you have part, uh, motion of charged particles, then you will create a global dynamo inside your planetesimal, right? And this will uh, overprint the uh, signal from the protoplanetary disk. So to be sure that what you're measuring came from the protoplanetary disk, there's a lot of uh, mineralogical and textural uh, studies that must be performed in, in, in parallel to, um, to the paleomagnetism uh, measurements. So what have we learned from, uh, from this? Here on the left, you have the uh, magnetic fields that have been inferred for, for the protoplanetary disk in y-axis as a function of the formation time of the meteorite component. 
uh, that we get from ra radio, radiometric measurements, okay? And what we find is that the uh, meteorite components that were formed early in the, in the protoplanetary disks, so less than three million years after the formation, the condensation of calcium aluminum rich inclusions, they recorded a very strong magnetic field, in particular for chondrules that we find in some type of chondrites called uh, LL ordinary chondrites. They record a magnetic field of a few, of a few Gauss, okay? So for, for comp in comparison, the, the current magnetic field of the Earth is a few tens of Gauss, and the fridge magnet will be a, a hundred Gauss. Very important information. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, this mag magnetic field seems to have dropped uh, very, very quickly, and after four or five uh, million years, uh, we just have upper limit on the measurement. So there's basically no more magnetization uh, at least within the precision of the measurements. And that, that appears to show that the uh, protoplanetary disk, which sustained that, uh, that mag magnetic field in the early solar system, dissipated somewhere about uh, four to five uh, million years after, after the formation of calcium aluminium rich inclusions. And in fact, if we look at the astrophysical perspective, if we look at... Uh, young stars, and we measure the fraction of stars as a function of age that show evidence for a disk, you can see that after 5 million years, there's a very small fraction of, of uh, stars that show evidence for these disks. So in that case, we have a very good agreement between the meteorite record and the uh, astrophysic uh, information. The last thing I'd like to mention about this uh, slide is that, from what I read, in theory, ALMA, <clears throat> through measurement of circular polarization, should be able to uh, measure, infer the presence of fields around uh, young stars that are only a few hundreds or a few thousand of ghosts. Uh, from the literature, I could only find upper limit. There's, a, there's some detection of linear polarization, but the origin of linear polarization of this is not uh, entirely clear. Uh, from what I understood, the uh, circular polarization measurement should be um, tracing the existence of, uh, of a magnetic field around other stars. And so from what we see from the meteorite record, so some meteorites have been magnetized at a few goes. Well, in theory, with ALMA, that should be detectable, okay? Um, so that's just to encourage people <laughs> working with ALMA to <laughs> get these measurements. Um, yeah. And that's, uh, that's basically the, uh, almost my, my last slide. The, the last slide is probably the most important. I hope I've convinced you that the uh, study of uh, magnetic field in Meteorites is very important. I've explained how it can tell us things about our protoplanetary disks. It can also teach us a lot about dynamos that uh, occurred in uh, planetesimals. So if you find a meteorite, don't do like this guy. Uh, basically, I've just Googled or, or uh, oh no, it was in YouTube. I wrote in YouTube um, how to identify meteorite. I clicked on the first video. And that guy, after 51 seconds, he say, oh yeah, you can stick a magnet on it and because meteorites are so rich in metals and iron. Uh, probably if, the, if, the, if, the, if the, the magnet sticks, it's a meteorite, which is true. But by doing so, you, you, you are destroying 4.5 billion years of magnetic information about our solar system. And it doesn't matter if we are be below the curing point because these magnets are so powerful that they, they, can, they can destroy all this information. So, uh, that's very sad. I, I have a friend who's studying uh, um, Martian meteorites, and she's been gathering Martian meteorites around the world from people. They are really hard to find, and she her goal is to prove that uh, Mars has had a global magnetic field at some point in its, its history. And if he, if he did, it means he could have sustained an atmosphere and what wa uh, water. So so you know it's pretty significant to to know this kind of stuff. Uh, and all the meteorites that she got, they were all remagnetized by hand magnets, all of them. So there's nothing she can tell about uh, 
the magnetic field of Mars. Um, so if you find a meteorite one day, um, uh, you find a weird rock and you think it's a meteorite because it's uh, it's dark, it has this fusion crust and it's well, it looks like something that looks like a fusion crust and it's heavy. Uh, then just bring it to a museum or bring it to someone who knows about meteorites and uh, they will be able to perform some non-destructive non measurements uh, that, that allow to confirm the, the nature of these rocks. Okay, so I hope if, if there's one message from this presentation that you remember, it's, uh, it's this, this one, okay? Uh, so that's the end of this lecture. The next one will be about the astrophysical perspective of studying uh, asteroids and comets using ground-based and space-based uh, telescopes. If you want to learn more about this subject, I have, a, I have a YouTube channel where I sometimes post uh, some uh, interviews of people uh, working in the field. There's uh, interviews about uh, meteorites, space missions to asteroids, planetary magnetic fields. I've also started to interview some people, uh, at, uh, people at ESO. Uh, if you want to know who, just uh, <laughs> uh, click on, on this uh, video. We have very talented science communicators among, uh, among us. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>